Okay, um, my name is Fernando Rodriguez Villegas, you probably know that. Uh, we have, um, this is the beginning of algebraic topology. So I'll be giving five lectures and uh, my colleague Lothar Goethe will be given the other five. Um, so I'll be writing in this paper that gets projected up there in this sheets will uh, we'll scan them and make them available to you if you want to later look at the lecture. So you're welcome to take notes, but also whatever I write here, you will have a chance to see later. Okay, so what we're going to do um, is uh, today and to and next class is uh, discuss the fundamental group of a space, of a topological space. And as a way of uh, motivation, I'll start with some concepts of multivariable calculus. So first of all, um, what is algebraic topology? Kind of the name says quite a bit. Um, we will associate to spaces algebraic objects, for example, groups, rings, and things of that nature, that will allow us to for example, distinguish a torus from a sphere. So these two topological spaces, uh, I think it should be visible from the drawing that they're not uh, homeomorphic, but um, to actually prove it in a rigorous way requires some tools. And this algebraic topology will uh, give us uh, many such tools. The fundamental group is um, an invariant that we're going to associate to a topological space and it has to do with uh, loops. So um, to say it intuitively on a um, on this torus we have for example, this loop that goes around, if you think of this as a, as a tire of a bicycle, you can tie it around and then uh, it seems it should be intuitively clear that this path cannot be moved around and may disappear. Whereas if you do something similar and try to tie a um, string around the sphere, you can again totally see that you can pull it out and make it disappear. So this loop is not really attached, not tied to the sphere, whereas this loop it is. So what will happen is that the fundamental group will, of the sphere is trivial, and the fundamental group of the torus is definitely not. Okay? So that's sort of that's just to give you a sense of where we're going. So we're going to start by discussing um, paths. And I won't be very uh, giving you all the precise details. Um, uh, on top of the description that should be on the website about uh, what the is the bibliography, I will also be following this book by Fulton, which I recommend you have a look, um, Algebraic Topology, of uh, William Fulton. So um, he starts with with a uh, reminder of calculus and it will give, he gives a lot more details than I will. So I will sort of try to make a quick summary. So if we have um, a path in the plane, by that I mean a map from say the interval 0, 1 to R2, we would like this map to at the very least be continuous And let me just say smooth in the zero interval. And one, to do this precisely, you also have to worry about what happens at the edges. But I'll skip the details. Um, I want just to give you a sense of what we're going to do in comparison to things I hope you've seen. 
you must all have seen some form of multivariable calculus before, right? So when you have uh, in multivariate calculus, one of the things that you do is you consider line integrals. So if we have an expression of the form p of xy dx plus q of xy dy, you um, can, in a path, you can make sense of the integral of the path um, of the, this object, which is a differential one form on a path. It's defined to be the integral from 0 to 1. You basically replace the x by its um, parametric form given by what the um, path is. So the path here for a value of t has a coordinate x of t and y of t. You've seen, you all seen this before? Yeah, you do physics, you all kinds of things, you, you, this is a very fundamental concept. And if you assume the functions p uh, and q are continuous, you have a continuous integrand, then the, um, the uh, integral makes sense. And one of the things that, um, that is crucial is that if it happens to be the case that your differential form, omega, has the form like this, which we abbreviate by saying that this is df for some smooth function f, then what happens? It's a question. <laughs> Sorry? But more precisely, the integral doesn't depend on the path as one answer. It only depends on the beginning and end points, but more precisely, yeah, uh, that's also a special case that the, he's saying that the integral over a closed path is zero, but I want, a I want a precise answer. I want, I'm looking for an answer to what is this, if we have such a omega on a path gamma. He's saying is omega of gamma zero, gamma one minus omega gamma zero. That's almost right. <laughs> Just what is uh, there's something behind this you know very well, right? What is it that will give us what the answer is? What's it called? Something something of calculus. No, yet yeah, there's much simpler like this. We doing computing the integral of something that is d of something, right? It's the fundamental theorem of calculus. If you integrate the derivative of a function, you get the function back, right? This is just done in sort of a, it's done with a path form, but if you plug in into this definition of the line integral, this expression for f. In other words, if you plug in the fact that p is partial of f with respect to x and q is partial of f with respect to y, and you write it out, you'll see that you can apply the fundamental theorem of calculus straight away, and you'll find that this is f of the endpoint minus f of the initial point. And as he was saying, if the endpoint and the initial point happen to be the same, then this number would be zero. But otherwise, it's whatever it is. But the point is, as Hugh had said at the beginning, in particular, 
this integral only depends on the endpoints. Correct? Not on the actual path. But this is the case for this particular kind of um, differential form omega, which is uh, called exact. Okay, now so I'm going to introduce or discuss a particular kind of differential of this sort. So this uh, discussion I just all talked about R2, but we can also just concentrate on any particular open set of R2. So let's consider the open set U to be the right hand, uh, right plane in R2. So let's look at the open set where X is positive. So in the usual coordinates, X comma Y. Okay. And in this open set, so if this is X and this is Y, I'm looking at X positive. If we have a point of coordinates x comma y here, I want to look at the angle measured counterclockwise from the x axis. Okay, so let's look at that function angle, and um, my points are in the right plane, so they can go from here to there. Right, I don't go past. So that uh, theta angle is a perfectly well-defined function on my open set. So it goes to, let's say, the real numbers is the function theta, is the angle. Okay, so it's going to go more precisely between minus pi halves to pi halves. And if you um, use the standard trigonometry, you can write it down as the inverse tangent of y over x. Okay? Now, I want to compute d of theta with the notation that we had before. So I want to find what is the partial derivative with respect to x and the partial derivative with respect to y. Anybody know? No? Okay, I'll write it down in the, um, given that we have limited time, but I'll suggest you actually do this calculation, which is not hard. Yeah? Just out of curiosity, how many of you have seen complex analysis already? Some of you have, right? So I'm doing things over thinking of R2, but many of these things are, um, have, a, in fact, a simpler um, uh, description in terms of complex variables. This would be uh, dz over z. Mistaken. Okay, now look at what happened. We started with an open set U, which X is positive. We computed this D of this function, which is certainly uh, angled. This is a smooth function. We get a smooth differential form. And now the thing to note, the D theta is, um, I'm going to call it omega, omega is well-defined where? Where does this expression make sense and give us a differentiable one form? Sorry? 
everywhere except 0, 0. So this is well defined in R2 minus 0, 0. So now we have a differential form that's defined everywhere except the origin. And in particular, if we take gamma to be the path um, e to the 2 pi i t, or what's the same cosine of 2 pi t sine of 2 pi t, so we parameterize in the circle in standard form, starting at this point and going around once with a zero in the middle. What is the integral of omega on this path? Yeah, it's rotational. Something is rotational. We're moving in a circle. This is our path. And we're integrating on that path going around the circle counterclockwise once this particular differential form. And it has an answer that you must have seen before. There's no complex numbers, I, except I did that as a shorthand. When you do the integral, you have a real differential form and you integrate on a real path. The answer is a real number. So you're off. He's, he said 2 pi i. The answer is 2 pi. I mean, all of this I'm saying is multivariate calculus and it shouldn't be hard to do. I suggest you do. I'm just going quickly because I want to get, this is sort of as a motivation for what we're going to be doing. I don't want to spend um, a lot of time on it. So why does this not contradict what we've said before. So if you recall what we said before, let me bring it up again. If our differential form happens to be d of f for some smooth function, then the integral doesn't depend on the actual path. It only depends on the values of the function at the endpoints. In particular, the endpoints are the same. In other words, if the path is closed, the answer is zero. The circle is certainly a closed path, starts and ends at the same spot. Why is it that I integrate this and I don't get zero? Because omega this should tell us omega is not the f of a function in all of R2 minus the origin. It is um, d of something as calculated here, but in this particular open set. In fact, it's going to be such in any open set as long as it doesn't completely enclose the origin. Okay, so this tells us that so there's another thing to observe here is that the integral, in fact, if I multiply this by r so that I have a radius, circle of radius r, the integral is also 2 pi. So what I'm trying to get at is that um, for, for one thing, the integral not only doesn't depend on the path, um, but this is true as long as we can sort of deform the path uh, in a continuous way. So, for example, if you have something of radius 1 and you move and you change the radius, you will get um, a sort of, you can think of this as a deformation of the circle into the bigger one. And that's um, one of the features of this um, story is that paths don't really play so much of a role, but they, what it plays a role is um, these paths up to it continues the formations of them. Okay, and so what we, the fundamental gonna, group is going to do is capture precisely the nature of paths up to 
uh, the continuous deformations. Okay. So, um, but this that we're discussing is something that is happening in the um, world of things that are being smooth. And what we're going to do is transition to something where uh, we just assume that functions are continuous. So the a story about the fundamental group is about topological spaces of uh, completely arbitrary with no uh, smoothness involved. So we're going to repeat uh, some of these arguments, but done completely in the setting of continuous uh, functions. So, just to um, continue with this, these thoughts, what happens if I take the path to be gamma n? Which is e to the 2 pi nt, which is cosine 2 pi nt, comma sine 2 pi nt. What path is this? <clears throat> Sorry? It goes, n times it goes n times around the circle. What happens if I integrate the same differential form on this path? 2 pi n. Okay, <clears throat> so what this is going to lead to is the following. So let me say it in words and we'll eventually prove, at least give um, some of the details of the proof, is that any path on the plane minus zero that starts at uh, a point, say, on the circle one, so this is the origin. Any path that you draw on the plane avoiding zero will have a winding number. It'll be, it will, you will, will be able to measure how many times it goes around the zero. And what will this translate into is that, um, let me call this x is, uh, so I don't have to write it all the time. The uh, fundamental group of this space is isomorphic to the integers. Okay, so every path will have a certain number of turns around the origin, which will be described by an integer. An integer which is positive, you go counterclockwise a number of times and negative if you, if you go the opposite direction. And up to deformations, which I will make precise in a few seconds, every path has a, attached to it an integer, which is exactly the integer that measures how many times it goes around the origin. And um, so up to this deformation of paths, every uh, path looks like the one we just drew, gamma n for some n. So any path, no matter how crazy it is, can be continuously deformed to be one of these simple ones that go around the circle in one direction or the other a certain number of times. So this is one of the fundamental uh, examples that we're going to uh, discuss in more detail. But this is one way um, to describe um, to see what the fundamental group can do for us as an invariant of spaces. Um, the same thing applies for x, the unit circle, because any path that you have in the plane minus the origin, you can shrink it to fit into the unit circle without changing its, um, the nature of what this measures. Well, the technical term is that is homotopic to a path on the unit circle. And so what 
we have here is an, a, uh, a first example of a case where the, um, the fundamental group is not trivial. All right, so this was meant as a motivation, and now I'll try to be a bit more precise. There are many definitions and many little things to check to, do, uh, to progress with this theory. So I'll prove a selective few, and I'll leave some for you to as an exercise, but you also, I suggest you actually read the book and do the steps as indicated in the, for example, in the book of Hatchers, which you can don, download online, right? You know that, the, the book you can get free online. Um, it's one of those tedious things that one has to do once in your lifetime. You know, if, you, if this is the first time you've seen a fundamental group, this is the time to do it. Of course, unless you have to teach it, in which case you have to do it again. Um, okay, so now back to something a bit more formal. So X is a topological space. A path will be simply a continuous map from the interval 0, 1 to x. Okay? And notice that I dropped the condition <clears throat> that um, anything about smoothness, because x has no smoothness uh, necess uh, in is intrinsically any sense of smoothness. It's sim simply a topological space. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm going to call I to be the interval 0, 1. Again, so we don't have to write that many symbols. So gamma is a, is a map from uh, I to X. Um, actually, I'll take it back, and I'll f as much as possible, I'll try to follow Hatch's uh, notation so you can compare when you, if you read it, so I'll call it that F. Okay, so we say that two paths, F0 and F1, are homotopic. So now we're getting into the fine detail of what a deformation means if there is a homotopy between them. So what does that mean? We, wa we want a function, capital F, from I cross I to the space, which is continuous, and it has the following uh, properties. So for a Hatcher, the parameter on the path is S, which sort of uh, is the kind of thing you have when you parameterize by arc length, if you are in, uh, in Rn. So, at, so T, let's think of T as time. So what we're going to think of, maybe I'll do the picture first. We have a starting point, which is going to be fixed at all times. We have some path F0 and some path F1. And the homotopy will give us a deformation. So think of this as a movie that starts at F0 and as time progresses from 0 to 1, ends up in F1. Okay, so at any given time, we'll have some path that goes from x0 to x1, okay? And so what I want to, uh, will write down are precisely those statements. So we're going to think of t as time. T, at time 0, we have f0, and at times 1, we have f1. And the fundamental thing that we want is um, that at any given time, the path has initial uh, point x0 and final point x1. So at times t equals 0, we want to have f0. At times t equals to 1, we want to have f1. And this will not be 
such a great notion. We also, as I said, want to fix the fact that at, for all time, um, the, the initial point is x0 and the final point is x1. Is that clear? So this is a precise way to define what it means that F0 and F1 can be sort of the form from one to the other. The existence of this function capital F, this homotopy, is uh, the precise definition of what it means uh, sort of deformation. But this is sort of done in an abstract way. This space is completely, uh, X is a completely abstract uh, topological space. So if you want to think of i times i as a square, which is helpful for, for some of the things we're going to do with this notion in, in a little bit, and you will want to do that in your in the homework. <clears throat> uh, so think of this axis as s and this axis, axis as t. So we start at time zero with F zero. So as you move S along this path, you see F zero. And as you move up in time and you get to time T equals to one, you move over on this segment and you see F one. At, at all times, you see X zero here and X one there. So if I take some time T like a half, you might see this curve that I had dotted there. Okay, so this is uh, formalizing the idea of a deformation of a path, which, um, as we were saying before, is a natural notion, for example, in multivariable calculus or just calculus in the plane. And this notion of deformation is important because typically things like line integrals don't, are not sensitive to uh, deformations of paths. So the path itself is not that important. What is important is its class up to homotopy. So the next thing is to precisely say that homotopy of paths is an equivalence relation. So that it makes sense to talk about the class, the homotopy class of a path. Okay, so um, let's prove this. We need to prove the um, conditions of equivalence. So what's the first thing we need to prove? That a path is equivalent to itself. Okay, so this is the kind of thing that I said is sort of a tedious work that hopefully you'll see that is worth our time because it will pile up and create a fairly powerful theory. So how do you, what is a homotopy that goes from a path F to itself? Just you don't do anything at, at all times, you have F, okay? So that's easy, so I won't even write it. If F0 is uh, equivalent to F1, already I'm abusing notation because I'm writing that it's equivalent, we, we, we still don't know, but anyway. Um, so there's a homotopy that links F0 with F1. What is the homotopy that links F1 with F0? You reverse the order and you just reverse time and you start at one and you finish at zero. Okay, so I won't also write, I won't write that, e that one either. And this one, the next one requires a bit of more work. So let's, let's see how we can do that. And as, as I said, I'm going to do, uh, do this one to give you the very, a, li a little bit of a hint of um, the kinds of arguments that one does for many of the things that we'll do later, which uh, I'm going to skip uh, the precise details of. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, a, a picture always helps in this business. So here we have 
F0. Here we have F1, and here we have F2. Okay, so there is a deformation that goes from F0 to F1, and there is a deformation that goes from F1 for F2, and now we want to find one deformation that simply goes from F0 to F2. Okay, so let's take a little time to do this carefully, and, uh, and then after that I'll, I won't be as careful as that. So what is the actual um, homotopy that we should use? By the way, um, Hatcher do, uses, uh, does that, uh, this, and I think is a useful... So we have this capital F function, um, and it, it's convenient to think of uh, the capital F function as a collection of F sub t's, which are the path at time t. Okay? And this notation is consistent. When t is 0, you get F0, and t is 1, you get F1. Okay, so F and a half is, is this, for example, this dotted line that we had before. So we have, um, so then I should be a little bit more careful, and maybe what I'll do, um, yeah, this, let me do this. Let's say G0 equals to G1 is um, homotopic to G1. So we have a homotopy, capital F, which gives us a sort of a family of paths, F of sub t, and we have a family of path G sub t. So what I want to construct now is a family of paths that goes from F0 at times t equals to 0 and G1 at times t equals 1. Okay, so how do we do that? So I want an H sub t such that H of 0 is F0 and H of 1 is G1. Okay? So what do I do? Okay. Right. So basically what we want to do is put these two thing, two families together, one after the other one. Okay, so let me write that down as um, was suggested. We're going to define A sub T in two pieces from time T equals one half, zero to one half, we use um, F sub t, but we want to go twice as fast, so by the time we go to the middle, we are already done, okay, so we want to have f of 2t, right? This will tell us that at 0, we have f0, and at 1 half, we actually have f1, correct? Because we are going twice as fast, and between a half and 1, we want to start at g0, and end with G1. So if you think about that, is what he was uh, saying. We do 2T minus 1, if I'm not mistaken. Right? So T equals a half gives us G0, and T equals 1 gives us G1. And this is the homotopy. Nobody complains? Am I done? No, I'm not done. What should this H be besides doing that it starts at, at the right place and ends at the right place? It should be continuous. Otherwise, is this completely useless? Okay? So how do we know this function is continuous? What's that? Pasting. Pasting them. And you know how to do that. Okay, good. That's what I wanted to do. So this is the kind of thing you have to do, okay? You will have to find various homotopies 
that do the kind of thing you want to prove these results. But of course, you have to make sure you've done it right and that the resulting function is continuous. And I won't actually every time point this out or try to do it, okay? So the arguments are all fairly similar uh, of what we want to do. So I'll just um, account on you that you uh, know how to do it, and some of them will be in exercises that I'll give. Okay, so now we have equivalences of paths. The, uh, any path determines a unique homotopy uh, class. It's an equivalence relation. And now comes the uh, fundamental idea, is that we can multiply paths. And in fact, we can multiply homotopy classes. And uh, for this to make sense, we have a path going from x0 to x1, followed by a path that goes from x1 to x2, say f uh, and g, or again, to be maybe per better, I'll write this y0 and this y1. If the path f ends where the path g begins, then we can define f times g to be the concatenation of the paths. And again, we need to verify that we can do this in a continuous way, in the sense that uh, the path is a continuous map from the interval to the space. So the intervals, we could have chosen any, uh, any closed interval that you liked, but we stick to 0, 1. So this is parameterized from 0 to 1. This is parameterized to 0 to 1. So to put them together, we shrink again the interval to half to get uh, the beginning to be f, and then the second half to be g, and then we put them one after the other. And um, so what we're going to say is that f times g is f of t, now t, uh, sorry, it should be s, s is the variable that is moving um, in the parameterization, and um, then after that, sorry, um, I guess I should have put f of 2s, thank you, and g of 2s minus 1, pass that. And again, you have to do a little thinking to convince yourself that this is a continuous map. And moreover, this wouldn't be necessarily that uh, good of a notion, because the path, there's just too many paths. Homotopy classes are the thing we are after. So what we want to verify is um, that the homotopy class of f times g depends only on the homotopy class of f and that of g. So, I'm, uh, so here, this I'm defining to be homotopy class. Okay, and so um, finally we get to, to the thing we want. In particular, if uh, f and g are loops, so that is f of 0 equals f of 1 equals g of 0 equals g of 1, equals the same point x0, then um, f times g. So we define the product of the class of f times the class of g to be the class of f times g. Since the both all everybody starts and begins at the same point, we can concatenate them. Uh, it, this construction before requires that one ends where the other one begins. Um, this gives us 
So the main point of this whole discussion is that this product gives the set of homotopy classes of loops at x0 the structure of a group. Okay? And this group is denoted by pi1 of x, comma, x0. And it's called the fundamental group. Okay. And what I was saying before is that, for example, the fundamental group of the circle or what's the same, the fundamental group of the plane minus the origin is isomorphic to the integers. Okay? So we are going to prove uh, this fact. There's a few things that we need to verify. We define an operation on homotopy classes. We, I'm claiming that our operation gives rise to a group structure, so there's a couple of things to verify. But um, let's um, do one simple thing first. Okay. Um, suppose X inside Rn is convex. Okay. What does that mean? Do you know what it means? Sorry? Sorry, I can't quite hear you. Right, so what he's saying is if you take two points in X, X and Y, say, and you, join, you take the segment that jo uh, joins them, which, which makes sense in Rn, that whole entire segment is included in your set X. Okay? So um, if that's the case, um, if F and uh, 0 and F1 are paths from, uh, so are from I to to x that start and end in the same the same points then f0 is homotopic to f1 Okay, and why is that? How would you define a homotopy between any two paths whatsoever? So here's our convex set, say, in R2. Not quite that, sorry. So this is our X. So here are two paths. Sorry? Right. So we can simply take a linear homotopy. We take a T. Uh, do I want T or do I want 1 minus T? Uh, I want 1 minus T times F0 plus T F1. So at any value of s, f0 of s and f1 of s are points in our set x. This linear combination for any t gives you some point in between the two and a line between the two, which by assumption, because x is convex, is a point of x. Correct? And so this is a path in x that starts at F0, starts at F1, and what are the values of this at 0 and at 1? Ft of 0 is 1 minus t times x0 plus 
t times x0, so that's x0, and the same for 1. Since the points are the same, the segment between them is simply the point itself. And so this is a homotopy and certainly a continuous function. And so this is a homotopy between the two paths. So in particular, if x0 happens to be equal to x1, if we're talking about loops, then uh, every, um, every loop in x is homotopic to any other. If we talked about the homotopic classes of maps or loops being a, forming a group, what would be the identity of this group? It's a class. We can, what would be an element that determines the class? Go ahead. The, there is a tr completely trivial loop, which is the one that never leaves the starting point, the constant lo uh, loop. So, for example, then, F0 or any F is homotopic to, let me abbreviate by just saying the point, or uh, maybe more precisely, X0. X0 as an abuse of the path that is always equal to X0. Okay? So, <clears throat> if, if given the statement and the fact that this particular uh, element is the element, the trivial element of the group, what is the fundamental group of a convex set? Trivial. Everybody is homotopic to the, to the trivial path. So, in particular, pi 1 of x, x0 is trivial. Okay, so uh, for example, x equals the unit disk has trivial fundamental group. And if you are work listening keenly and, uh, and you're worried about these things, you maybe should be complaining. Why do I call it the fundamental group? Well, somewhat tacitly in this statement, I'm saying the fundamental group is trivial. But this is a, a little bit of a pedantic point, but it's worth uh, being careful. What is necessary to define the fundamental group? You're talking about a space and a base point. You need to pick a base point to talk about loops. They have to start and finish somewhere. Okay? So a priori there isn't just one fundamental group. There is as many fundamental groups as points that you could choose. Okay? So Let's be slightly careful about that. So in many circumstances, the base point doesn't play much of a role, as we'll see in a second. But you have to remember that is there. Okay? The, the invariant is not associated to just the space. It's associated to the space together with the choice of a base point. Okay, so before, uh, and we still, we still left aside the proof, the proof that this thing was a group, but let me... Um, before we do that, let me mention this statement. So, just to get it out of the way. So, if X is path connected, what would that mean? Any two points can be joined by a path. That is to say, there's a continuous function from the interval 0, 1 to the space so that starts at x0, start in x1. So if x is path connected, then pi 1 of x, x0 is, 
is, uh, is um, unique up to isomorphism. Uh, that's not a good way to say it, but let me try and be more precise. So more precisely, if x0, x1 are two points of x, then there is an isomorphism between these two groups. The groups are physically distinct. Okay, so they are two separate objects, but they happen to be naturally isomorphic to each other. Okay? And in, in, um, in algebra and well, many situations in math, it's, it's worth being careful about that, not because it can lead to easily to some confusion. So how do we do this? Well, we have x0 and x1. The, the space we're assuming is path connected. Okay, so there is a path that joins them. And I want to define my, um, uh, let me do it this way. I want to define a map from the fundamental group with base point x1 to the fundamental group with base point x0. So if I have a loop uh, starting and ending at x1, what would be the natural uh, loop that you associate to it that has a base point x0? Well, you go from with this path to x1, then you follow the path and then the loop and you come back. Okay, so what you do is you take a path, if you have a path gamma, uh, now I went to, so path f, and this is h, then you first do h, um, then you, um, Then you do f, and then you come back. And that come back is the inverse path, which is defined to be the path that goes backwards. Okay, and so this will give us the isomorphism between the two groups. So well, with uh, some abuse of notation, one can talk about the fundamental group because uh, oftentimes you, this is the kind of spaces you're going to look like. Of course, if you have a space that looks like a circle over here, union the disk, if you pick your base point here, you're going to get z. If you take the base point here, you're going to get trivial. So, you know, you have that tri kind of trivial, trivial situations. Often, you, you, we're just going to stick to uh, one path-connected component. Uh, otherwise, things are, are clear what, um, what the trouble is. Okay, so with that uh, proviso, one can speak of the, the fundamental group. Okay, so now let's go back to uh, proving the proposition. So we would have to prove that we have an identity element, that um, the, there is an inverse. Okay, so I'll leave those to you. So trivial element is the path that is always equal to x0. The um, inverse of a path f is not of the path of the homotopy class, is the class of F inverse, which, as I said, is defined to be the path going backwards. And these two things, of course, need a proof, but is, the proofs are not difficult. I'm going to skip them and just give the, the fact that the, um, the product is associated. So if we have three paths, we should... Um, see that we have a homotopy between f times g first, followed by product with h, and the product done in the other way. 
And I'll sketch the proof of this fact and I'll leave the other ones to you. As I said, they're all sort of very similar in spirit and they're worth doing at least once in your life. Okay. So, um, how do we do this? Well, let's see. The, we want to write this homotopy. So we want to write a homotopy that relates the left-hand side with the right-hand side. So we do f times g first. We um, take the interval 0 to 1 and divide it by 2. And the first half will be f. And the second half would be g. And now we're going to multiply that by h. So we take this interval and divide it by 2 and then follow it by h. So what will happen is that if we do it, um, if we look at what we're doing in the left-hand side, here we're going to do f, here we're going to do g, and then after that we're going to do h. Right? That's the sort of division and pasting of the interval that you do to do the product on the left hand side. Is that, is that clear? Whereas on the, on the other side, we um, first do f all the way, the halfway, and g and h like that. So what we can do is simply take a linear map that takes the interval divided this way into the interval divided that way. So what we want to do is that if we go from zero to a quarter, we actually want to stretch it so that it goes from zero to a half. And then from here to here, it goes from a quarter to a half. That's uh, moving a, a, a step of one quarter. We want to keep it to be a quarter. But then this one that goes a step of a half, we want to shrink it so that it goes as, uh, as a step of a, a quarter. So what we can do is simply write a linear map that does that from the interval to itself. And so the picture is this. We start with, with this from, and we want to reach on this side this. Okay, so from zero to a quarter we want to move like that, so that uh, when we get to the end of the quarter, we are actually at the half. Then from here to here, we want to move straight. Okay, and then from here to there, we want to move um, half as fast, so that we get to one. Okay, so this is typical of this type of game that Often, you, the, the best way to approach this is to try to think in these terms and do a little picture, and then you, know, you have to write it out. It's a little tedious, but um, this already is pretty much the proof. Okay, and so we call this function phi. Okay, and we just um, compose... Um, so take the path f times g times h, composed with phi um, of t, and this will give us the homotopy. Okay, so again, I'll skip... The details, you have to convince yourself, make sure that this is a continuous map, etc. Okay. So, then, so this is a very powerful uh, fact that um, homotopy classes of paths can be multiplied and this multiplication turns into um, take, turns the set of homotopy classes into a group. 
So this is the paradigm of algebraic topology. You start with a space and you attach to it some algebraic object, like a group or a ring, or something of that nature, and then you would like this um, object to allow you to, for example, differentiate two spaces or prove things, understand things about the space you started with. Okay, so when you uh, have a construction of this sort that you start with a, uh, an object of one nat some nature and you end up with an object of a different nature, um, you, I'm sure you already know by now that you don't just want to convert objects, you also want to convert maps. So what we uh, expect to see is really something called a functor, something functorial. So if you have a map between two topological spaces that is continuous, it should translate into a corresponding map between the groups. Okay? So that's indeed what happens. So this construction is completely functorial and um, you end up with a, a functorial map between topological spaces and groups. Okay? <clears throat> so if we have phi, so we have two um, two um, topological spaces x and y and a continuous map that takes x0 to y0 remember that you have a base point so it's not just the maps in this category that we are considering is not just the maps, the continuous maps that map a space to another, but you also have to keep track of the uh, base points. So let's do it before we talk about loops, about uh, paths that go between uh, two different points a priori. So we have a map I, so we have a, a, ma uh, a path that goes from uh, the interval uh, so we have a map that goes from the interval to x. Um, then we can continue that with a map, phi, the map phi that we have to y, to obtain a map from i to y. And if it, um, the, so if this um, phi of, um, sorry, if, f of 0 is x0 and f of 1 is x1, then by construction this new path f composed with phi takes 0 to y0 and 1 to y0. So and it suddenly continues. This is a composition of two continuous functions. Excuse me? Oh, y1, thank you. <clears throat> and this, um, so it takes path to path, and this, um, this is compatible with homotopies. So it's again a simple matter to verify that if you have two homotopic maps f0 and f1 on going to x, then after you compose with phi, you're going to get two homotopic maps going to y by composition with phi. And so this leads to uh, the fact that then phi gives a map go phi lower star that goes from the fundamental group x0 to pi 1 of y, y0. So if x0 is equal to x1 and y0 is equal to y1. So in particular, spaces that are homeomorphic will give rise to um, isomorphic fundamental groups. Again, being careful with the base points. So the fundamental group is a 
invariant, uh, let me be uh, more precise, the isomorphism class of the fundamental group is a um, invariant of the space. And um, I don't want to completely start, maybe I'll do a little bit of the, non, the first non-trivial calculation that we'll do, which is to, uh, in fact, compute the fundamental group of the circle and prove what we somewhat argued before, that that group is the group of integers. And not only that, but that the, the integer that a homotopy class of paths in a circle is, is its winding number. Okay, so it's not just a completely abstract isomorphism, it's something we, we can understand what is the meaning of the, that isomorphism. Okay, so I want to uh, mention an application, assuming that we already, uh, we have already done this, um, this uh, proof that the fundamental group of the circle is um, Z. Let's do a very simple application of the idea of the fundamental group. But it proves something that uh, it would be complicated or difficult to prove and somewhat surprising um, if you didn't have these tools. So this is uh, a theorem due to Brouwer. In, um, now where's the U? Um, in here. Um, 1910. So if we have a continuous map from the disk to itself. So D here is the unit disk in the plane. Okay, so this is a continuous map. Then H has a fixed point. In other words, there is an X in D such that H of X is equal to X. So that's kind of a surprising fact, and um, we'll see that it follows relatively easy with the tools that we have at the moment. And um, just as an illustration of the kind of things that one can do with these tools. Okay, so let's, uh, let me sketch how the proof goes. This is explained in, carefully in the book, so you can also look at, look at it there. So suppose it's not the case. Okay, suppose that we never have that h of x is equal to x. So let's suppose that h of x is not equal to x for all x in the disk. Okay. So we're going to define a map from the disk to the unit circle. As follows, so it's better to, to see it through a picture. So here's x, say, and here's h of x, the value of the function. And because we assume that h of x is not equal to x, it makes sense to talk about the segment that, jo that joined them. And I'll do that. So I'll draw the line that goes from h x to x. I mean, that joins. Um, so in this direction. And it hits the circle somewhere. OK, and we call that r of x. OK, so. This map, R, is continuous. 
I guess we would have to be a bit careful and to verify this, but if you slightly move the, the x, the function h is continuous, so h of x is not far from it, from what the original value, and the sec so the whole segment is not. That's a bit of a wavy hands argument, but hopefully uh, that should be enough. Um, what else can we say about this? Um, what happens if x is in the unit circle? What should be the value of r? x itself. Okay, that I guess is part of doing this carefully because we have to define what it means, to the value, but clearly the value of r, if we want this to be continuous, has to be that the value is itself x. Okay. So what we have then is a map. So we have a subspace, topological subspace of the space D and a map back to S1, which is the identity when you compose. Okay, so this, such a map is called a retraction. So you can think of this as sort of pushing the D down back to the subspace. Okay, so you pull the subspace up and you then, you know, this kind of pushes it down, keeping the subspace as it is, unmoved. And now I want to show that um, such a retraction cannot exist. And let me say first in words, and then we'll describe the proof. The point is that if there were such a retraction, we would get um, that the fundamental group of the circle is trivial because the fundamental group of D is trivial. So in other words, given that we have this map, we're going to be able to retract any map, any path on the circle using the fact that we have D at our disposal. And we know that that cannot be true because the fundamental group of the circle is not trivial. Again, assuming that fact that which I haven't yet completely proved. Okay, so uh, let F0 be a loop in S1 and just pick your favorite base point. At this point, it doesn't really matter. So uh, in D, there is a homotopy Ft between F0 and say, uh, let's say base point X0. between that path and the um, and the uh, constant loop x0. Why is that? Sorry? D is convex. We talked about this already. Okay? So if we allow ourselves to the path to, well, it's sitting in S1, but if we view it as if it were sitting in ND, in D, then we can shrink it to a point within D. Okay? I mean, and we could write it out. I mean, we can write it out as we did before with just a linear homotopy. So now we consider the composition of R um, with Ft, right? R goes from D, so we take this homotopy and we push it down to S1. What we're going to get is a homotopy in S1 between that path and the point, and we know that is not possible. So the point is then that this homotopy 
um, is a homotopy between F0 and X0 in S1. Right, so R composed with F0 is F0 because, um, because it's the identity restricted to S1 and R composed with the point is the point. So that's a simple um, consequence of the fact that the disk has trivial fundamental group, which allows us to retract any path uh, to a point, whereas, I mean, sort of shrink a, a path to a point, whereas the circle we have been arguing is not, does not have a um, trivial fundamental group. Okay, so um, I, I'll start maybe a little bit with the proof of the, um, of the fact that the circle has Z fundamental group. But before we do this, so, so far we haven't done a whole lot. I mean, we have two examples. Either the fundamental group is trivial. For example, if the space is convex, a, sub, a convex subset of Rn. Or we are claiming is Z if it's the circle. So for all you know, you can be thinking, well, this is kind of a boring invariant. It's always a billion. Let's see two examples we have. Do you have, I don't, I don't know, you know, your background very well, so you may have seen much of this, and I'm repeating myself. Uh, but just, um, if you have seen it, then don't answer. But if you, if you, this is the first time you've seen a fundamental group, make a guess, just give a suggestion for a space that has fundamental group that is not a billion. What's that? Eight. Sounds like you answered too quickly. Maybe you, you knew this in advance or no? Well, okay, he's saying you take the eight. So if you take this space, so the two circles joined at, at the hip, this will have fundamental group that is not a billion. I mean, we don't have all the tools to be able to show this yet, but we will. So, but let's just argue um, intuitively. I mean, much of this requires sort of both. You need to have the technical tools to be able to prove things, but you also, the intuition is important to get a sense of what is happening before you actually can prove it. So, what do you think is the group, the fundamental group of this space? Let's take that to be X0. That looks like a natural point. You seem to be trying to say something. Sorry? Yes. C plus C. He's suggesting that because the fundamental group of the circle is Z, maybe what we have is Z, maybe Z cross Z, or Z plus Z as a group. Any thoughts? Huh? Yeah, well, it will still be a billion, but that's a guess. We, I'm assuming you haven't seen this, and we're trying to, you know, trying to understand this intuitively first. So why do you say Z plus Z? You, we have at least two paths that look like we cannot shrink, right? If you go around one circle and we go another, another circle, that looks like paths that, you know, you cannot homotopy that to, to be trivial, right? Which is, which is the case, because each one separately... Um, that's what happens if we just had one circle, so that looks natural. But um, we have, therefore, looks like two really independent generators. But in fact, it's not secrecy. Because, in fact, they do not commute. Okay, but this will, we'll need to, to get into this. Um, so it's, in fact... Um, 
the free group in two generators. Okay. So there are two generators with no relation between them, but that do not commute. Okay. So in fact, it will be a non-abelian group. But again, this is for later. Um, so let me uh, just state what I should be starting with on our next uh, lecture, which is uh, a fundamental fact that we needed to prove the, uh, the fact that the fundamental group of the circle is Z, but it's something that is in itself important. Okay, so, so <coughs> excuse me, I'll, I'll start with this and time will run out and, and uh, I'll uh, start again when, next time. So, we, and now we're going to concentrate on the circle and try to understand it. So, a, an important fact about the circle is that you can view it as um, well we can the language we're going to use is the language of a covering. So clearly the trouble, and this is what we were trying we were struggling with when we started with uh, circles and winding numbers and so on, is the notion of angle. And we cannot, we argued, define a continuous angle all the way around. Right? At some point, the thing is going to not match. So what we're going to do is embrace this problem and take all possible angles. Okay, so instead of thinking of the circle, we're going to think of a cylinder. And so we uh, are going to keep track of all the possible angles, so um, this is, I'm going to do m just an intuitive discussion first. So instead of trying to have a continuous function of angles, we're just going to um, sort of remember how many times we went around. So instead of thinking of just the circle down here, we're going to have and elix. So what uh, we're going to need is the fact that if you have, let's just think of a simply the path that we talked about going around n times on the circle. So what we're going to do is try to define an angle all through that path Okay, so think about it. You start here, you go around, but instead of just keeping the angle, you, you also go up. Okay, so by the time you, you come around to the beginning, you're not at the same spot anymore, but you're on top of it. You did one turn. Okay, and then so if, you, if the path went around five times, you will have five of these uh, uh, little turns on the... Um, ellipse under the helix and you will end up exactly on top of the same spot you started with but five steps on top okay so this um, this map is going to be um, uh, the kind of thing that will clarify for us this idea of winding number and which is the same ultimately as the statement that well, as a more refined form of the statement that the fundamental group is Z. Okay, so the, the map that we want then is the map that takes S to e to the 2 pi i S. In other words, cosine 2 pi S sine 2 pi S. So let's think about how this map, what are the properties of this map? So here, think of S as the, um, this height, right? So if we have height zero, um, we are here, 
So if we simultaneously keep track of S and the turning, we have you know, this turn and this goes like this, like that. So this helix sort of unravels the circle. So this will be height one, height two, and so on, height minus one, and so on. So what can we say about this map? I'm gonna call it P. So P, what can we say about the inverse image of a point Z in the circle? Say this point here. What does this image look like? Sorry? Yeah. It's in the circle, so all we need is the angle. Yeah, go ahead, you was going to answer. So it's some value of s, maybe I'll call it z0, some angle, z, some z0, s0, then plus what? What are the possible ambiguities to this? This is the angle, well, sort of up to factor of 2 pi, 2 pi is up to an integer. So, and also we can be a bit more precise if we take a little open set around this uh, Z0, what is the preimage of that? Well, they're going to be, the preimages look like this, and they're all going to be little segments um, going up. So the preimage, let me call this subset U, is a disjoint union of um, V N with n and z. So this would be v0, v1, v2, etc. v minus 1. Okay? This is the disjoint union. And if I look at p restricted to one of these subspaces, these open subsets, it maps to u. And it does it in a homeomorphic way. OK? So this is a kind of a fancy way to say that we can define a perfectly one-to-one -one angle as long as we don't try to do that too far away. OK? And in fact, is, that's this statement. But also that there, the ambiguity what for angles are integers. Uh, up to, of course, a multiple of 2 pi, which I am factoring it out. So this type of map is what's called a covering map. And what we'll see is that the fundamental group is absolutely um, tied with the idea of coverings, and which is a, yet another angle to this story that, in some sense, is even more important than the uh, case of the, the, the understanding of the fundamental group. So this map, this uh, stretching out of the circle into this helix is what is going to allow us to prove, in a, in a sort of rigorous way, that the fundamental group of the circle is the um, integers. So basically, let me say in words, and I'll end there, if you have a ab completely arbitrary um, path loop uh, on the circle, you will be, will be able to unravel it, and the ending point minus the beginning point, whatever you want to start, is going to um, differ by an integer. That integer is the thing you are trying to capture. That integer will completely describe the homotopy class of this path. All right, we'll continue next time.